Welcome everyone to the Baltimore Association of Black Journalists, our October 1st event, I'm sorry, our October 2nd event, and we're going to dedicate it to covering election 2020 and all the ebbs and flows that you all have experienced. We have a great panel here. Without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our moderator, Mr. Charles Robinson, and he will let you know who this esteemed panel are, who are also in the Zoom with you. Thank you very much, Denise William Romer and Ernie for joining us today. Charles, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nikki. First and foremost, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Charles Robinson and I am a political reporter at Maryland Public Television, but not only do I cover the state of Maryland, but I have an expertise in black politics in America. And uh, many of the folks that you are going to see on the call with me today have been with me on this journey for a long time. And uh, we have been watching and, and recording and writing and you know broadcasting to the world about what we're seeing. Um, I'm going to jump right in with just some simple rules, if you don't mind. First of all, if you want to participate as we're talking, do me a favor, put it in the chat, and I will pose the question in it to the various participants. That way you're going to get a chance to uh, do it kind of in real time, but then we'll open it up to regular participants. I want to begin with some uh, data that's out there that you may or may not have seen. If you will call up, Nikki, the first slide, which is uh, the one regarding um, the, the amount of people who are doing the pre-voting. I think that is one of the most fascinating things that uh, uh, I think all of us are watching because I'm gonna tell you, we're gonna break records. Uh, we're gonna break records not only with pre-voting, mail-in voting, and I believe in-person voting. You notice that there were, in this slide that you see up here now, there were almost 70,000 people who requested ballots uh, and if you look on the right-hand side there, you'll see how much of an increase that was. Probably the most interesting thing for me is the uh, uh, right underneath there talks about mail-in and early in-person ballots being returned. That number is just incredible when you think about it from a political reporter's perspective because we have had people who have actually uh, done this before, but not at this level. Obviously, the COVID crisis has forced a lot of people uh, to move in this direction. Just to let you know, I got this information from off the NBC website. There are various other websites that the uh, participants who uh, are going to be joining us are going to be talking about. So let's just get right into our uh, participants, if you will, Nikki. Uh, I want to introduce to you, some, some of you may know them, some of you may not. The first is Denise Clay. She's a political editor at the Philadelphia Sun, which is a black newspaper in the Philadelphia area and uh, around Pennsylvania. I also have William Ford, who is a reporter with the Washington Informer. He covers Prince George's County and the District of Columbia. He'll be kind of giving you a sense of what's going on there. Uh, additionally is my good friend, Roma Jeffers, a political reporter at the Dallas Morning News. Uh, Romer will remember this. I asked him almost maybe 10 years ago, what should we watch in Texas? And he said, watch the state of Texas go blue. And guess what? It is about to happen. The other person is Ernie Suggs. He's a political reporter at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Obviously, Georgia has now become this unique hotspot uh, in, our, in, our, um, in our political landscape because for the first time, we may get a Democrat in the United States Senate from the great state of Georgia. So let me allow each of them to tell you a little bit about what they're working on and what they're doing. Let's start with Denise. Denise, you have the floor. Hi, everybody. And, and thanks again for um, having us, Nikki. And, 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 you know, as someone who is about to marry a Baltimore native. I, I kind of <laughs> consider this my, my second home. Um, in Pen right now, Pennsylvania, for all intents and purposes, looks like where the glitch might happen, um, where folks, because well, we're, everybody knows we're not going to have a winner on election night, right? Everybody's already kind of made their peace with that. 
And one of the places where, you know, things are really going to get kind of off the rails is probably going to be Pennsylvania, because for some reason, um, how we're voting here has really been bothering the Trump administration. Um, our Attorney General Josh Shapiro has spent more than a little time in court um, with them regarding mail-in ballots and where you can drop off your ballot and you know various things um, regarding mail-in ballots. For Philadelphia, for example, has really been turning out in terms of mail-in ballots and early voting, but no one knows if that's going to get the necessary push and everybody's you know hoping for at least on the democratic side um from the city of philadelphia because the with the exception of when trump won in 2016 the conventional wisdom has always been how philadelphia and pittsburgh go so go to state because that so goes to state because that's where most of the people are but that's not what happened and what we're and what everybody's wondering is how much of the middle section, or as James Carville called it, the Alabama section of Pennsylvania <laughs> is going to turn out as opposed to everywhere else. But um, keep an eye on Pennsylvania, particularly in, in terms of the legal decisions, because a lot of, you know, because of how Pennsylvania generally goes with the more populous areas actually deciding things, um, those, those, um, court cases could have an impact on turnout and, and you know whose votes get counted and when they get counted because there's also a case involving how far uh, how far after election day you can count the votes um, so there, there's a lot about the voting process itself that people need to kind of pay attention to on Pennsylvania thank you Denise appreciate that uh, I'm going to shift gears I want to go down to Georgia Ernie Suggs Ernie uh, they've started early voting down there in Georgia. What's going on? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, Georgia is uh, is very interesting because we're very, um, the people here are very mobilized to get out and vote. We've had 7.6 million registered voters here in Georgia, and about 2.1 million of those have already voted early, which is way, way heavily exceeds what we've done in pe previous years. And out of, the, out of those 7.6 million voters, we're expecting about 5 million people to vote this year. Uh, and if you look at that, if you look at the fact that we have over a, a million more registered voters this year than 2016, uh, Georgia is definitely becoming that kind of like that, you know, I like to always say that Georgia and Atlanta is the center of the universe. And I think that this is one of those cases in which the, um, well, you know, and, and I'm sure we can get into this uh, later, but in 2016, 2018, Georgia went through a very, very contentious uh, gubernatorial debate. I mean, gubernatorial race. Stacey Abrams versus the current governor, Brian Kemp. And there was a lot of accusations of voter suppression. Uh, Stacey Abrams lost by 55,000 uh, votes. She lost to um, the former state uh, secretary of state who refused to recuse himself from the whole electoral process while also purging the voter rolls. So there was this big allegation of a feeling of, of voter suppression. So. In 2020, people are saying, hey, you know, I'm going to get out and vote early. I'm not going to trust um, getting out and voting on November 3rd. I'm going to get, we've had three weeks of early voting. We're, Monday begins the third week. And we've had long lines, five or six hour lines, which is also another form of voter suppression. But it's also another form of people saying, I'm going to get out there and vote. I'm going to make sure that my vote is counted. I voted on the third day of voting. Um, in my local library, the first day was six hours. By the time I got there on Wednesday, it was only 45 minutes, which is not bad. So, you know, um, and we'll talk about this later, but you know, Georgia is a traditional red state. And right now, for one of the first times since probably 1992, when Bill Clinton was running, the state is up for grabs. And, uh, you know, Biden has a really, really good chance of winning. Kamala Harris is here uh, yesterday. Jill Biden has been here several times. Trump has been here several times. And Pence has been here several times. And when you consider the fact that Trump and Pence are coming to Georgia and spending resources on Georgia, you understand how important this, this state is. Hey, let me jump now down to uh, the great state of Texas where Gromer Jeffers uh, writes for the Dallas Morning News. First of all, Gromer, you were in uh, Belmont where they just had the last debate. 
talk a little bit about that and talk about what's going on in Dallas for us. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Charles, and thanks, Nikki. Look, um, the debate, Trump uh, wasn't as unhinged as he was in the first one. Uh, so for his base, they were probably happy about that because the blood, I mean, he was bleeding, leaking water. Uh, whether it changed anything or not is, is doubtful because as the, my fellow panelists have, have pointed out, uh, so much voting is already in the bag. I mean, it seems like the cake is baked to an extent and not a lot of undecided. So it's, it's kind of a turnout uh, battle. Uh, and it's amazing, Ernie, how Texas is similar to Georgia, sort of a new battleground, Texas, Georgia, Arizona, states like that. And um, millions of people have already voted. We have a three week early voting period as well. The, the, the last week starts Monday. And also, while there's been a lot of emphasis on suburban voters, suburban women, former Republicans that the Democrats are, you know, are trying to woo, people are warning the Biden and, and, and the rest of the Democratic Party not to forget communities of color. And there are more black voters in Texas than any place other than Ernie, other than Georgia. <laughs> and, and so he's gonna um, argue. He's gonna argue with you about that. No, no. Uh, Georgia has more. There are more more <laughs> black voters than anywhere in the country except for Georgia. So um, they're they're urging Biden to sort of make the investment in Texas, but not only in the community at large, but make sure you get communities of color out, whether it's African, uh, black voters, Hispanics, and even Asian voters. And so that's what's going on here in Texas. It is a battleground now, it's up for grabs. Federal work in 2018 came within 2.6, percentage points of beating Ted Cruz in Texas. And so there's a lot of excitement about what can happen now. We'll see if Biden can push the, the rock over the ledge, but definitely it's a battleground it's exciting for a lot of folks here. Appreciate that. Uh, Will Ford, uh, I'm going to give you the floor, but let me give, uh, there was a question about this idea uh, from a lot of uh, one of our uh, uh, attendees about this cannibalization of voters. I can tell you uh, in Maryland what I have seen in, in, in the lead up to the last four elections is that there are larger numbers of pre-voters, what I call folks who said, I'm just not going to wait until the last minute to do it. I can tell you for the last four election cycles, because I got to go cover it, I, I get in the line and, and do the pre-vote. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it by mail-in ballot this year. I think that in Maryland specifically, what you're likely to see is a smaller turnout on election day, but you will see a larger turnout as all of our participants have said to this point of the numbers of people who are energized and ready to vote today. While the president would like everybody to vote on election day, uh, I think that that's one of those kind of things. But William Ford, why don't you give us an idea of what's going on because on Monday begins pre-election voting in the state of Maryland. Go ahead, Will. Thank you all, good afternoon, what's happening? Sorry for my, what's going on with my computer? I wanna throw it out the window, but I need it. So <laughs> let's step back. Now, in Maryland, it's totally different from the battleground states of Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Texas. One reason is you got the Baltimore, DC suburbs, heavily democratic, that's based on population. So, and, and let's even take back from early voting. 1.4 million have already went and re, um, recorded and um, registered for early ballots already. And about 45% have already turned it in. So when Charles is saying that people are energized through that method, yes. Now, the State Board of Elections believes there's gonna be longer turnouts. I agree with what Charles is saying. Give you an example. I took my ballot to the Prince George County uh, uh, drop-off ballot board, near the Board of Elections office. Lines of cars, lines. I counted about 17 cars waiting to drop off their ballots. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna go back there and, and do an interview. A gentleman named Artis Watkins from Mr. Kites. He basically said, he paraphrased, 
I'm not, I'm voting. I can want to wait in line. I can easily put my ballot in the ballot box. Plus that fool has got to go. I didn't even have to ask who the fool was, but of course I had to anyway. So who's the fool you talking about? You know, the guy with the orange face. I said, okay, thank you very much, sir. So Marilyn, and matter of fact, got your college, went and did a poll, and Malia Cromer, who political science professor who runs the poll, the biggest thing she, that they, she was looking at is how big will Joe Biden beat Donald Trump, which could be the first time since 1964 when Lyndon Johnson beat Barry Goldwater. That shows you how big the Democratic poll here is in Maryland. And also the central committees, and, and check it out in Baltimore too, some of the central committees are helping make phone calls in some of those battleground states. One, to help get Biden elected. Two, they're so confident that Democrats will win in Maryland, they say, why not help out? Appreciate that, Will. I want to uh, do, ask this question to the panel, if you will, and uh, I want to start with Grover. Grover, um, you, you live in the Dallas metro area. Right. There's a number of uh, efforts underway to both target white women outside of the metro area. Right. Would the Democrats be better served? I don't know if you can answer this question or if you have asked this question. Why aren't they targeting the African-American community? Is it, is it about money? Is it about ideas? Well, you know, give us a sense of what you're hearing out there. Well, it, it's frustrating to a lot of people because they have the money now to do, to do both. Biden is sort of flush with cash. And um, a lot of times, let's just say what it is, there's a, this feeling that the African-American vote, that the Black vote is locked in and you don't need as much outreach in, 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 in our community as you do say for suburban voters in Plano and, and uh, you know, other areas like that, the suburbs outside of Houston. But as we saw in 2016 and even in 2018, if you can get the black vote in Texas up to the Obama levels of 2008 and even 2012, Man, that means you you win if you're a statewide candidate with everything else going on. And, and so um, they are targeting black voters, but not to the level that, uh, that, that some operatives think that they should. Particularly when you, outside of Biden, other down ballot candidates, we have a Senate race uh, featuring John Corn and the Republican incumbent. Very few Black folks know who MJ Hagar is. Running wow, John that, is, that, that is unfortunate, I think. And in October, Charles, that's a problem, right? If they don't know you by October, that is a problem. So, you know, she's, she's started outreach now, um, you know, in, in, commun in, in the Black community, but it's something that should have been going on months ago, if, if not, you know, when she first entered the race. So these are the sort of the things that frustrate uh, some longtime Black Democrats who know, hey, if you take our community seriously, then you have a better shot of winning. And, and they shouldn't have to beg for resources and money. But yeah. Let me go to uh, Georgia and, and Ernie. Uh, obviously, the metro Atlanta area, I have seen some articles in your paper and other publications about this idea that they are afraid of the, the if you will, the, the lawlessness in, in, in Metro Atlanta. And that is why a number of white women aren't moving towards Trump. Once again, I ask you the same question. Are they targeting, uh, are, are the campaigns trying to target uh, African Americans uh, in and around the metro area, because there are a large number of African Americans in those areas. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I think they are, but like Gromer said, I think I think it's kind of also reactionary, and it's reactionary and it's taken for granted, obviously. Right. Because right. you know, mm -hmm. ninety-four. I think I wrote a story. Ninety-four percent of Black women voted for Trump, and um, I mean, voted for Clinton in twenty sixteen. You know, 94, 95% of black women voted for um, Jones in Alabama in 2017, 2018. So 
the Democrats know they have black women. Last night, uh, for example, Kamala Harris is in town and her whole pitch was to the black voter. And that was because she's countering what Donald Trump is doing in terms of trying to attract black male, particularly black male voters. Over the last month, I would say, I've been to two events here in Atlanta that have been specifically targeted at black voters. One in which Donald Trump attended, the other in which um, David Perdue and the Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, his cousin, attended. So they are, the Republicans and Trump are making a, a concerted effort to try to get out and try to woo black voters, particularly black men. Uh, and, and, and I think the Democrats, because they've taken black voters for, for granted so long, have had a hard time catching up and, and everything that they're doing is kind of reactionary. Will the majority of black voters vote Democrat? Yeah. But, you know, any percentage that peels off is a percentage that you might lose this election. So I think that they should have been doing perhaps more if they want to kind of secure that vote and, you know, offer them something. And I don't want to kind of go on and on about this, but one of the things when I wrote about when Black women voters, one of the things that they were very impressed about in Biden was the fact that they did, that he did pick Kamala Harris. And it was one of those sense, it was a sense of, we've given you our support, Black women have given you our support forever. And you've, you've only said, yeah, we agree, I agree. Thank you for your support, but you've never given us anything. And the fact that these Black women, you know, that coalition of Black women said, we not only want a Black woman on the federal court, on the Supreme Court, we want a Black vice president. And the result of that was Kamala Harris. So I think that they, they see victory in that, but they still see that there is more to be done. I hear you. Thank you, E. Uh, First and foremost, uh, just to respond to Kelvin's uh, uh, inquiry, um, and Will, you can you can chime on in, on this if you want. Um, Kanye West qualified in the state of Maryland as a write-in candidate. Uh, you obviously have seen uh, the comments from Ice Cube and others. Um, I want to point people back to, and I'll have Nikki call it up later or at least put it in the chat. My blog that I've been writing since 2004 on is called Charles Black Politics. One of the things I talked about is this individual I call the other. It's a black man who's about 60, 60 to 65 years old. He didn't get a formal education. He went into the military. He is a, uh, he, he usually works in uh, construction, home improvement. He has uh, been in the military. When the Star Spangled Banner is played, he stands and he salutes. This is an individual that I see in this campaign is not being paid attention to. If you ever look at the polls regarding how many African Americans are voting for Trump, this guy is in that group. He's the other. And they don't know how to talk to him. But the pro Republicans use the pull of God and the fact that they will listen to him. Just like Ernie was talking about this whole idea of, we got the black woman. This guy is not necessarily thrilled. He is even less thrilled about the Black Lives Matter movement. And I, I advise you to watch that. But let me go to uh, Will Ford right quick. Will, I want to talk to you a little bit about this whole idea of, you know, these folks who are going to be uh, trying to go to reach, you know, voters up in Pennsylvania. How effective is that? Well, depends on what part of the state you live in, like Denise was saying. Now, not, sh not don't have a big grasp of nationally, but in terms of Maryland, really the suburbs of DC, black, a lot of black folks have already had their mind made up. Now, one quirky thing that I saw early this week, and as a matter of fact, everybody can picture a particular neighborhood you live in and you know it's heavily democratic. You know there's Biden signs all over the place. Well, if anybody's been down here in, in Prince George County, area called Suitland, heavily black, right near the district border, Little Big Hood, there was a little Trump pence sign right beside a fence of Biden 
parents. Either somebody came through and put that joker there at the, like two in the morning when nobody was around, or they were just bold enough. So in 2020, can't sleep on nothing. Point blank period. However, some of what I'm seeing is not as big as other states are nationally. You, a, lot of, a lot of the stuff going on in Maryland is really your local stuff. Look at judicial races. And one thing, let me, and I'm going to mention this a little later. I want to make sure folks, when, um, I think what Ernie was talking about, getting black folks. How about those who are incarcerated? You, they, although it, I think it's about 7,000 estimated who are eligible to vote here in Maryland, 7,000. Those numbers can have an effect locally, especially if you have judicial races that go on, like circuit court judge. Circuit court judges know what they do? Well, let me explain just very simply in Maryland. They handle major criminal cases, divorce, child support. Who do a lot of folks that come before those judges? They look like us. So those races have major, major impact. But I'll explain a little bit about that later. Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, let me um, go to Charles. Yes, Denise, I, I was coming to you. Go ahead. Because there's actually a point, and it was something that Ernie brought up when he was talking about um, black men and black women in terms of the voting. Folks don't like it when I say stuff like this, but 90% of why Hillary Clinton lost Pennsylvania was because she was a woman. Straight up. Because when you look at the people who won from the Democrats in Pennsylvania in 2016, all of the guys won. Josh Shapiro won. Um, Tom Wolf won. All the guys won. The women lost. And the fact that the Republicans know to target black men as opposed to black women, you know, to me, that's another form of sexism. And it's a sexism that works, especially if you spend any time at all on Twitter, you see it works. And I think that when we talk about this stuff, we have to, we, we have to be conscious of the fact that a lot of it, I mean, for a lot of people, kind of like that other you were talking about, Charles, for that man, if his woman is trying to run something other than the kitchen, that's going to be a problem. So if, you know, while I'm not saying that you should, you know, disregard those folks, you should also remember that this is where they're coming from. And the vast majority of folks, particularly younger folks, don't necessarily feel that way. And, and, and De Denise, it also shows, right, that, that Black folks have different views, whether you like them or not, right. uh, just like any other community. You just can't assume that everybody thinks the same way. No, and, and, and nor would I. But I think that when we don't talk about right. the part that sexism, sexism is going to play in this election, and not only sexism, but the kind of sexism that you get when you put a Black woman who is also of Asian descent on a, on a presidential ticket, that hasn't reared its ugly head yet. And you, you have a lot of people who, you know, the polls may be saying one thing, but I remember all those same polls saying that Hillary Clinton was going to be president of the United States. A lot of people take their voting very, very personally and keep it a whole lot closer to the vest than we want to admit. So, you know, I, particularly in places like Pennsylvania, I, I, I don't buy it. I, I just don't buy it. Ernie, I want to ask you a question because one of the things that was clear during the run up to Obama's first election and his second election he was able to galvanize the 18 to 29 year olds. How difficult is it in the, in the Georgia area for that group who, um, you know, unfortunately uh, believes you can vote by cell phone and you can do it on TikTok and whatever uh, social media device. Uh, are, is anybody trying to reach them? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I think that, you know, this is where Stacey Abrams live. And for those of you all who know who Stacey Abrams is, she ran for governor in 2018. She lost by 55,000 votes. And, you know, she didn't, you know, she didn't fade away, as you, as you all know. Now she's running one of the country's largest voter education and most, she's running one of the country's largest and most influential voter education outfits in the country. So she's an example of someone who's out there trying to reach these people, trying to reach these younger voters, trying to reach rural voters and black voters and, and voters who are people who are eligible to vote who haven't voted before. So in terms of trying to get these voters who, who do not understand the process, who have never participated in the process, Stacey Abrams is an example of one of these organizations that are out there trying to get it. You know, uh, people under 35 make up 33% of Georgia voters. You know, oh, that's a and, big number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, people over 65, yeah, I think the group is 18%. Um, so, you know, that, that group, that younger group of under 35 is very big and very powerful, very all-encompassing and very diverse. So I think that they are kind of getting it. Um, you know, we're going to, you know, when you look at these long lines that we have, and there are young people out there, there are people, there are old people out there, there are people in wheelchairs, they're black, they're white. Uh, one of the things about it is that, uh, I don't know how it is in Texas, but, you know, I couldn't, I didn't go to my regular voting precinct to vote. I went to kind of a centralized neighborhood hub. So in these centralized hubs, you kind of can see the diversity. You know, I'm pretty sure there were some Trump voters. There were some Biden voters in the line because you saw all these kind of different kind of groups who are coming from a larger area to vote in a particular area as opposed to voting in their neighborhood precinct. So I think that the effort out there to get these younger and, and, and our previously disenfranchised voters out there is working here in Georgia. And as I said, 2.1 million people have already voted. Right. Uh, Grover, talk to me a little bit about uh, the young people in Texas. Um, and they're not necessarily motivated, or are they? Some of them are. Uh, the, the trick is always to get them out, right? You can get them registered, but actually getting them out to, to vote, uh, you know, it's up and down. You know, candidate like Obama was able to get a lot of young, young folks out. Um, others, not so much. This election has so much interest that I think think you will be able to, to get a great share of them out, whether, you know, whether they dominate the electorate, I don't know. They still rely on older voters here in Texas a lot. Um, but uh, Ernie's right too about the, the voting locations. You can vote at the American Airlines Center where the da Dallas Ma Mavericks play and you see people from all over the city coming uh, to vote there. But uh, they're different. And that's why this election is so fascinating. And and Denise is right. I mean, oh, you just can't. Yes. Pitch. Go ahead. Oh, Go you ahead. just can't have uh, the <clears throat> assumptions that you know how people are going to vote and why they're voting. Uh, and that's what makes it so fascinating. Um, uh, I wouldn't count Trump out because of the some of the things Denise outlined. It's just there's a a silent squad of folks out there who feel they feel one way and they're willing to to uh to dismiss all the things that are objectionable to a lot of people and pull that level level so we'll just have to see how it plays out i want to go uh real quickly if you'll do it in about two minutes because i want to get to some live questions as well um are there any races in your area that you can point to that we should watch uh, let's go to uh, Ernie first. Any, yeah, any we have two. Race? I mean, one of the things that makes Georgia so interesting, aside from the presidential races, we have two very contentious senatorial races. Uh, we have two incumbent uh, Republicans, um, uh, David Perdue and uh, Kelly Loeffler, and they are both in races for their for their lives, basically. Loeffler, the, 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 for, the, for this group, I think the interesting race is the Loeffler-Warnock race. Warnock <laughs> is running against Kelly Loeffler. Kelly Loeffler is like this billionaire. She was appointed governor. And Warnock is a Democrat. And we have 21 people running for that race, Loeffler's seat. And right now, Warnock is about 44%. He's polling at about 44%. Will he get 50% on November 3rd? That's, that's highly unlikely. So there's a chance that he's going to probably go into a runoff with Loeffler or um, 
House of Representative member uh, David Collins, who's also a Republican. So that right there, that Senate race right there is going to be very, very important. It's already very tight. It's already very contentious. And Warnock could make history as only, I think, the 11th Black senator, U.S. senator, first Black, first black senator from Georgia. And, you know, he's a, he's a pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. He's a graduate of Morehouse College. He's out right now all over the state today uh, campaigning. And, you know, every day he's increasing in the polls against Loeffler. So it's going to be pretty, he's, I can tell you this, on November 3rd, he's going to get the most votes. Then the question wow. becomes, and all of you all who cover politics will be, what's going to happen during the runoff? Will people come back during the runoff and support him? So that's the case. That's the big race right there. I want to ask about uh, an adjoining state to you, and that is South Carolina, Jamie Harrison against uh, 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 the, the senator uh, who is the chair of the uh, Lindsey Graham. committee. Yeah. I don't know about you, but he, I've been getting all kinds of messages from this guy. From, uh, from Jamie? Harris. Yeah, Harris. Yeah, Jamie, you know, he's raised, he's raised $57 million over the last quarter. Um, you know, it's South Carolina, so you never know. You never know what's going to happen during this election. I think we've all said that, but he has a pretty good chance. He's polling very well. He's doing very well. There's been a lot, a lot. I think even yesterday, a very prominent Fox commentator said that we should not vote for Lindsey Graham because he hasn't done enough to defend um, uh, President Trump. So, you know, who knows what's going to happen in South Carolina. <laughs> and, you know, Lindsey Graham had, a two, he had two horrible debates against Harrison. So, you know, but we'll see. I hear you. All right, then. Uh, you got the floor there, uh, Grover. Tell me who I should be watching down in Texas. Um, I, I mentioned the John Cornyn, uh, MJ Hagar Senate race. That's interesting. Cornyn has a, a, yeah, about a five to eight point lead. There's an interesting congressional race uh, in the Dallas area, 24, where Afro-Latina Candace Valenzuela is running for an open seat. Uh, against a former, former Irving Mayor Beth Van Dyne. And watch Charles to see if Democrats can take the Texas State House. Wow. Have, yeah, <laughs> That's a have, big deal. Yeah, That's they're nine seats deal. away. Nine <laughs> seats away. And um, they haven't held a house since 2001. Was that Ann Richards? Was that when Ann Richards was, was no, the governor? No, it was after Ann Richards, but, you know, it was during the last days of the white Democrat here in Texas, right? And uh, so we'll see. They're nine seats away. It will be close, but they have a chance to take control of the Texas House, and that will be big if, if that All right, Will Ford, tell me what I should be watching in this state. Well, as I mentioned again, a lot of local, 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 local. Well, you got Baltimore mayor, got the city council, and I'm going to go back to the circuit court judges again. Let me show you a little fun thing called a sample ballot. Y'all may have heard of it. Well, you can't see it. There's a little nugget here about the circuit court judges race. I know you can't see it. Don't worry about it. I'll explain it for you very quick. Well, Democratic sample ballot has a guy named Jared McCarthy. He's a registered Republican. It has folks in Prince George County on fire. They say it's just misleading. Also, they say that when they have this little line that says judicial candidates run on a nonpartisan basis, they say that's illegal. Well, technically, according to a 2004 Court of Appeals uh, suit and case decision, circuit court judges' races are partisan. Here's why. The, they are both listed on the Democratic and Republican ballots. Maryland is a closed primary. Those parties control it. So if you're unaffiliated independent, you can only vote for school board. See what I mean? Why circuit court judges, I'm telling you, they matter. There's a race in Prince George County. I think there's Anne, uh, Anne Arundel County, uh, Montgomery County. Now, what's interesting about this little sample ballot, and I know everybody here in Maryland knows about vote yes on question two. That's something to pay attention to because that deals with sports betting. A lot of the state neighboring states have sports betting, not Maryland. And when you look into the campaign finance, FanDuel and DraftKings has pumped $2 million in TV ads a lot of uh, campaign literature that everyone's gotten. Everyone in the county's gotten, twice by some people. Now, you're wondering, okay, that's one question too. They're trying to get these people in. Well, if you'd also look at campaign reports, well, who's part of it? Well, if you follow the WNBA and you follow University of Maryland, Marissa Coleman chairs that committee. 
that's a big name in Maryland. She won a national title with uh, Brenda Freeze. She said she played WNBA. She's over in Europe right now. So when you see little ballot questions like that, look to those campaign finance reports. They have gold mines, although they, it can read like you're watching turtles race. It, it, it can be very dry. It can be. But once you see little nuggets like that, that you, you look and say, well, why is Maryland so big on wanting to get this vote question? Because the neighboring states have vote better. Maryland wants to get that money too. And the main nugget of why they're pushing for it is the revenue will go toward education. Uh, Charles can go back and tell you about the lockbox that went on <laughs> when they pushed the vote in it. So I'll stop at that point. Okay. Thank hey, you. Well, appreciate Charles, it. Charles, do you mind if I, do you mind if no, I, go ahead, ahead. jump in. You mind if, okay. Hey, William, so for those yeah. of us who don't live in Maryland, everything we see is Kim Klasik. Tell us about her and this shit. <laughs> all right, all right, wait a minute. All right, I, I'm, I'm going to take this one on with okay. Go for it, Because I've had to write about this lady. You got Nikki lunching over there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so first and foremost, the one thing for Gromer and Denise and, and, and folks outside of the area who are watching, Kim Klasik is running against Kwai E.C. and Fume. Let me just tell you, she's already lost twice, okay? Three to one, she's lost. So you saw this viral video that the president picked up where she's wearing a red dress, walking through the streets of Baltimore, talking about the crime and grime. Probably the thing that's really ticked me off is the most recent campaign ad where she has her daughter. I would be the last person to criticize anyone's child, but I want to just remind everyone that child does not go to a school in Baltimore City. She claimed that I want to do better for schools, holding her daughter in the middle of Baltimore City. This woman lives outside of the district. Did you hear me? Mm -hmm. She doesn't even live in the district. She is, you know, she's media savvy. Uh, once again, I'm gonna report, I'm gonna point you back to my blog where I talked about her a little bit because Klasik is symptomatic of today's kind of new Republican. In other words, first of all, I must be willing to go into the lion's den and point out why or what they did wrong. That concept of pull yourself up by your bootstraps is a farce because first and foremost, let me begin with this idea. They can't figure out why their relatives can't pull themselves up by their bootstraps. The last part of that is this. Klasik is going to lose five to one. Mm -hmm. And you can go to the bank on that. <laughs> okay. And, and in addition to that, Ernie, no one, I can tell you all of us here from Baltimore, don't take her as a serious candidate. Okay. And that's, and <laughs> you see Nikki shaking her head. Even my college buddy said that, yep. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I was not ready and I had to interject at all. Like, nobody takes her seriously at all. Sister girl, help me understand how you couldn't survive Bowie State. University, <laughs> she want to run Baltimore. How? How, Sway? How? Do you want to tell the dirty little secret, or do you want me to um, tell the what, dirty about her husband, the strip club owner? Going, the strip club. I was, going to, I was <laughs> going to mention that. <laughs> I'm like, ma'am, we're being nice, but <laughs> your husband kind of runs strip the, I saw the pictures. I'm like, oh, my God, are you kidding me? Yeah, These Robert, are the kind of pictures that you stripper, make sure you get you know. rid of. <laughs> but, but, but I think yeah. that Kim, you know, because um, I met her at a uh, Blacks for Trump event, and I think that Kim is kind of what you were kind of hinting at, Charles, is kind of like that, that Black Republican, this kind of new Black Republican, and there's nothing wrong with being a Black Republican, but right. there's this kind of new Black Republican who is hell-bent on destroying Black Democrats and on hell bent on trying to justify why they are a Black Republican. We have a guy here in Georgia named Vernon Jones, who oh, that's the guy who was who was carried across yeah, the yeah state. he was crowd surfing he was yeah, crowd surfing like, yeah. crowd surfing please yes. and this guy was elected several times as a Democrat. He's a Democrat Democratic House member, although he's been ousted out of the party, but he still claims that he's a Democrat. But you know, if you look at his social media stuff, and embarrassingly enough, you mentioned Bowie State. Um, Vernon Jones went to the same college I went to, and our Facebook page, our alumni Facebook pages are burning up because they hate this guy now. But you know, he kind of represents this kind of dangerous fact faction of black people, I think, and I think Kim Klasik is the same way, who 
who are kind of becoming these representatives of what black people are and representatives of this kind of independent thinking black person that we should be. And I think that's a little bit kind of dangerous. I wonder if anyone else can. Yeah, the groupthink aspect of it always blows me away. Gromer, I guess you've got similar types down in, in Texas. Well, this is, she's kind of unique. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't they all? <laughs> yeah, but, um, but it, it, it's fascinating to just to hear you guys talk about, um, I guess, the, the new emerging Black Republican, huh? It, is, okay. is, go ahead. Well, go I was ahead, just going to say, um, when I covered the RNC in 2016, a lot of those, a lot of your new Black Republicans were there. And the main question I had for them was, you know, because I every year when you go to the RNC, you see Black Republicans because you have people who remember that when Lincoln was a Republican and, and it was a tradition in their family and all of that. So the one time that I've ever seen people literally run away from me when I tried to ask them a question was when I at, tried to ask these Black Republicans, how do you reconcile the fact that your standard bearer's first endorsement came from the former Grand Dragon of the KKK. How does that work within what you do within the party? And no one wanted to answer that question. I mean, people literally ran from me. And that's never happened in my entire reporting career where someone has literally ran away from me who was not an elected official when I tried to ask them a question. And when you talk to Pencil, when you talk to um, Black Republicans here in Philadelphia, you get some, you get a lot of, you know, justification about the business climate and stuff like that. But what they have not figured out, particularly in Philadelphia, where we have like two Republican members of city council, one of whom is at large, the other one is um, in a district that's so solidly Republican that Democrats probably can't even pass through, you know, after sundown. Um, you have you know, and, and neither of them are black, they don't quite understand that if you're gonna run for political office in cities, you can't try those national talking points because they're not gonna work here. In fact, you're gonna get laughed out of whatever room you're in, especially if you're in a place like Philadelphia, which is solidly union, very democratic, but is willing to give you a chance if you're not talking you know, that Donald Trump, you know, American carnage stuff. And, and folks seem not to be able to get that. Um, although, you know, I have to say seeing a, like a 60 year old dude hightail it, you know, in the opposite direction of me, he was moving kind of fast. You know, it was kind of, it was kind of interesting. You know? Well, let me, let me talk a little bit about a group that we all have kind of heard about but don't have no like a lot about. It's called the Lincoln Project. This is a group of Republicans who are insurgents who are anti-Trump. One of the black Republicans who joined that group is Michael Steele. I've known Michael Steele over 25 years and um, I'm wary of this group. And let me tell you what my reservations are. First and foremost, these are the same folks that demonized everything from Willie Horton to uh, you know uh, the welfare queens, and they were part of that group. That uh, uh, what's the guy's name? El uh, the Republican who died, and then had Lee that Atwater. Yeah, Lee Atwater. Lee Atwater. Lee Atwater. Oh. A lot of these are the same, mostly guys. And notice I put that up in quotes because they are targeting Republicans to convince them not to vote for Trump. Probably the most interesting thing was the amount of money they have raised in a little bit of time. And it's mostly, you know, they're not really doing big buys, but they're doing buys on social media. So you may see a, a Lincoln Project ad in your Facebook feed. Uh, you may also see it on your Twitter feed. And you're going like, well, how the hell did I get targeted? Or, and I can tell you, all of us who are political reporters, I am wary of people who just said, I want to follow you. And I, I usually zap people who are, they just joined like last month. I'm going, I'm not, no, I'm not interested in you. And I do, I, I, and I monitor who is following. Don't get me wrong. 
you can find my work because if you Google Charles Robinson, you're going to get a ton of stuff. Some of it ain't going to be nice. And trust me, I've Googled myself several times and I know what people say about me and I'm all right with it, you know, but the bottom line is, you know, um, you, we, we must be wary of these kind of projects because the question is, let's just give the, for example, if Trump loses, what are they going to do then? Well, they're going to make a ton of money because they'll tell people, well, see, see what we did? If they, if Trump loses, they'll be said, well, you need us too. And it's a um, very slippery slope, but I'll let others uh, chime in on that. Uh, Ernie, you want to chime on the, on the Lincoln Project? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't have the same, was someone else going to say something? No, 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 go, no, ahead. go, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. I don't have the same reservations that you have. Um, um, I, I, I kind of looked at some of the 60 minutes uh, um, piece that they had on them. I didn't see the whole thing. But, you know, I, I look at it as, as, uh, as a group of people who are, are, are definitely dis and, you know, who hate Trump. And they are doing everything they can. They work, they work, either worked with Trump or worked in the administration. And they're doing everything they can to not let us have a repeat of the last four years. So, you know, they have a billboard out now a couple of billboards out now in Times Square targeting Ivanka and Jared uh, that they are threatening to sue over. Um, so I don't have any, you know, I, I, I look at it all as kind of politics. Right. And, you know, I, you know someone, I, I saw someone post in the uh, chats that their ads are better than the Democrats' ads. And I think that, That's you know, probably I think, right. That yeah, is probably I think that right. One of the things is that the Democrats are often very reluctant to really dig deep and to really get in the gutter, which has probably been their problem for the last 50 years. And I think the, the Lincoln Project is kind of doing that dirty work for them. So I'm all for it. I don't have any problems with it. Okay. What about you, I mean, Denise? Oh, go ahead, Denise. Go um, ahead, Denise. Oh, wait. Well, a couple of things. One, um, the point about the Democrats not being willing to get into the mud. Um, I interviewed Cory Booker, who is possibly one of the nicest human beings that will ever be a politician. And I asked him why that is. You know, why aren't you willing to fight fire with fire? And he gave me something along the lines of, you know, if everybody fights with fire, you just get more fire. And, you know, people don't want that. But the fact that the Lincoln Project is doing so well with these ads show that maybe on some level people do want that. They do want to see you fight. But in the case of the Lincoln Project, I wasn't as surprised to see a group like this come up because I remember the first day at a Republican National Convention, a group of folks that called themselves the Never Trumpers tried to get the rules of the convention changed so that delegates didn't have to vote for the person that their state sent them to vote for for, for president, because a lot of them did not want to vote for Donald Trump under any circumstances. And in fact, the group, once their request to change the rules was turned down, got up and walked out of the convention while they were doing the roll call vote because they didn't want to vote for him. But that's kind of where this comes from. But I share some of your reservations about it because you're looking at a group of people that pretty much created the political climate that we're currently in through what they did with Lee Atwater and other people. And how I see them is the only reason that you're coming after Trump is because he's not nearly as heinous because he's far more heinous than some of the heinous people that you put in office. So this is kind of their form of penance. What'll be interesting to see is what happens after this election is over and they find a Republican that they can embrace. Whether or not they'll take all of this stuff that they have been you know, applying to Trump and apply it to someone else because it benefits them in that way. As for Michael Steele, on the one hand, I really want to feel bad for him because when they put him in that office of RNC chair, it was, he was supposed to be the, the, the like anti-Obama. And what he found out was that while he was the chair of the RNC, folks were not trying to give him the power that that position usually implies. I would be willing to bet that um, Rona Romney McDaniel is learning the same lesson, even though she won't tell anybody. 
So, you know, you really got to be careful about what you allow yourself to be a figurehead for. And that's kind of my reservation with the whole LinkedIn project thing. Who are, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend until he's not anymore. I hear you. Hey, Janine, uh, let me go to Grower. Grower, you, you, you lived in the state that Lee Atwater came from, and you saw the politics, the raw politics uh, during the Bush era. Uh, explain to us, you know, how Lee Atwater's mind changed over years. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 he was the author of the Willie Horton uh, ads that uh, basically uh, killed uh, Michael the caucuses, mm -hmm. right? Presidential run, uh, really, real hard charging. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because that it seems like an a, a eternity ago, right? But mm -hmm. I I see this Lincoln Project uh, situation as a Repub basically a Republican fight uh, and and a fight for control. Texas is is you mentioned. The Bushes, uh, George W. Bush's home, so uh, they have a strong presence here. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens afterwards because there's been a complaint by some Republicans that in their zeal to take down Trump, that they may also take down other Republicans as well. And they're actually moving on some Republicans who they consider Trump enablers in, in some states, some Senate candidates. So it'll be interesting to see how this fight crystallizes after it's, it's all over. Uh, and, and the other panelists, I, I agree with one thing. I, I don't have any opinion on them one way or the other. But I do think during the rise of the Tea Party movement, it probably would have been nice for a lot of people to see some pushback against that as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. During the Obama era and the Tea Party movement and, and all that was going on there. I hear you. Uh, Will, I'm gonna give you the last word on this and then we'll open it up for some questions. Uh, uh, you can, we, we'll let you unmute mute and ask a direct question to any one of us. Uh, Will, the Lincoln Project, what are you thinking? Well, I'm gonna be very quick and succinct on this. I have interviewed a couple of black Republicans here in Maryland. They, I can't use their names. They told me some stuff off record, but yeah, they like the Lincoln Project. Of course they do, but they still have those conservative mantras, taxes. Also one of them opened up and said, yes, I believe in the sanctity of marriage, man and a woman. Yeah, they won't come out and say it. So after this is over, they're gonna go back to being those same conservative mindset folks that they were as part of it. They just don't like Trump yelling out their dirty garbage. Let's just keep it real with you. And you, when you have very, when you have a progressive mindset of folks who, with the LGBTQ movement of same love, is loving each other, and you still have the socially conservative number of blacks, especially Prince George's County, because some of these folks are bougie. Let's just, just, just put it out there. They are bougie. And they are, and it's a lot of churches up in this joint too. And then just, let's just throw it out there. So you have a lot of men who control it. You have a lot of, I love the Lord, controlling it. But what does Prince George's County have? I know I'm going on a little tangent. Domestic violence is one of the top three crimes in this county. Matter of fact, top three in the state. So when you have, I know I'm, it's kind of a, a rent. You, like, you have some of these folks who are control freaks. They won't admit it, but when you hear how they say it, what they're about, what they stand for, that's why, yeah, you need to be careful about this Lincoln Project, but just give it with a grain of salt. Appreciate that, Will. Tell you what, Nikki, if you want to allow folks to come in and start asking questions, go right ahead. Okay, the way we're gonna do this is, um, if you don't mind uh, just jumping in, we're all journalists. You guys know how to rally for who wants to get that interview. If it gets too crazy, I'll start meeting folks again. So if anyone has any questions, please jump right on in. Um, I'm gonna get started with, I, I'm the person that threw in about the um, hip hop artists. I'm kind of curious as to what impact, if any, will it have in swaying the younger voters that are not in love with either party that are questioning the whole two-party system 
and that frankly don't see themselves voting their very first vote for either one of the two that are being given for presidential races. Well, I'll jump in. I'll be very quick. Mm -hmm. Governor Hogan, he voted for Ronald Reagan. He did his dad last time. Yeah. 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 What's that, Ted? <laughs> you only have to be a celebrity to know, well, I'm going to vote for who I don't like. Well, I'm going to vote for Ronald Reagan. You know how long he's been dead? But what's that, sir? I'm done. Anyone well, uh, I, I think um, in, in Philadelphia, where we basically have wannabe hip hop stars on every, co on every corner, just about, um, you're not hearing, oh, what you are hearing about um, folks like Ice Cube and, and um, Kanye and stuff. I mean, you have some people who are considering, you know, a Kanye vote. But you, you have, for the most part, you have people saying, where were you during the eight years that Obama was president? And where were you during the first three or four, the first, you know, three years of the Trump presidency? You know, why should I listen to you when you had nothing to say until three months out? You know, they're, they're looking at the timing and kind of scratching their heads. I don't know how much of an influence it'll have, but... All I, you know, the, the young people I talk to are pretty much just, you know, giving it some serious derision, if anything. Yeah, I don't think it'd have an influence either. I mean, you know, uh, 50 Cent endorsed Trump, or he kind of endorsed Trump, because, but that was because of his taxes. So, you know, what 50 Cent pays in taxes is definitely not what 99% of other Black people will pay in taxes or not pay in taxes. So that endorsement comes from a selfish uh, way. Uh, we had another rapper, Waka Flocka, Waka Flocka Flame, I think his name is. Waka Flocka Flame, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> I'm getting old. Yeah, but he's from Atlanta. You know, he endorsed Trump, you know, kind of in a tweet yesterday. So, but, you know, who who is Waka Flocka, Waka Flocka Flame? So I don't think that these uh, political endorsements or these celebrity endorsements are going to make that much of a difference. Let me uh, chime in a little bit because uh, I, I recently had to write about uh, this idea of uh, Ice Cube, uh, my good friend on the West Coast, who uh, has a PhD in Black political science. And I asked a simple question as it related to this. First and foremost, um, selling records is easy. Trust me. You know, you put your money down, you get your, you get your CD, download, whatever it is. It is messy when it comes to politics. And, and you want to jump into this environment, expect pushback. Understand, most of these guys and gals, they have PR groups that squelch, if you will, dissent. Politics is about dissent. It is why it exists. You know, um, you know I saw where Cardi B was, uh, you know, talking to, you know, various politicians, and I can tell all, tell all of you, as political reporters, we were like, well, that sounds interesting. That's about all it was. Now, as it relates to what percentage that they can bring to the table, not only two to 3%, maybe. But once again, if you want to muddy the waters, who better to muddy the waters with? People who are popular. And, and look, you know, Ice Cube's whole thing of, well, I want to do a contract for Black America. I don't know about you, but I didn't nominate him to go do that, or I didn't vote for him to do that. But, you know, look, you can do, you can literally do anything in America. And unfortunately, celebrity gives you a little bit of clout. Doesn't mean people are with you. And it kind of goes, uh, if I can just be very quickly, you know, people, there's always this thing about that black Republicans say is that no one called Donald Trump a racist when he was hanging out with Mike Tyson and Don King and Jesse Jackson and all these kind of people. This is kind of an extension of that, that, you know, 50 Cent and Waka Faka Flame and Kanye West are down with, with, with Donald Trump. So he can't be a racist. But, you know, you talk about that Ice Cube's contract. I would be much more impressed with, with Donald Trump 
if he had gone to Howard University or if he had gone to Morgan State and talked to some economists and some people who understand who understand the government, who understand the position of black people and came out with some kind of position paper that this is gonna be the contract for black America. Not, and I'm not saying anything against rappers, but not Ice Cube's version of it, but an economist from Howard or Harvard or Morgan State or UDC who has been to college and understands his stuff and has studied this stuff for decades. So this is just another extension of, hey, here's a couple of popular black people I'm not a racist, you know, go buy their records and go vote for me. That's all, that's all, that's the way I see it. And to um, lump onto that, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Go, go. Hi, everybody. First, oh, Hello. Hi. <laughs> Say hi, Vance. Hi, yes, Vance. hi everybody. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt the whole thing because I, I like the flow of everything. And I also love the panelists that we have, hey, Denise and everybody. I wanted to respond to like the whole conversation about rappers being a, a part of the election. Currently, um, there are rappers using um, working with different companies in order to have these election efforts to inform the youth on voting. Uh, one of those artists being Two Chains. Snoop Dogg has also been in the news recently for voting for the first time, as well as Shaq. It does seem like the younger generation, it, you know, there are they are trying to get into voting, especially due to the fact that music over the last four years have said. F Donald Trump, there's actually a song by this rapper named YG who has created a song saying F Donald Trump. And with the fact that, you know, more artists like Kendrick Lamar is being adapted in different protests and things of that matter, it does seem like the youth are trying to find their different ways. The problem is there are brothers in this world who are stuck with the normal, the normal forms of patriarchy being ruled, but instead of it just being it, 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 instead of it just being white men, it's more of both white men and black men specifically. And that you can see that through different rappers like Kanye West, like Ice Cube, like like many other, you know, many of these other rappers who continue to to make the same mistakes that are that some of our previous generations have made. So like I as a somebody that that covers this and is 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 also young and see this around him, you kind of see how like even though we know the smart decision to make this upcoming election. There are other brothers out here thinking about making another decision, which in some way may work towards Trump's favor, unfortunately. And I've seen it per personally, it's crazy. I had a question about, um, that followed up to where, is, where are these celebrities getting their influence? Where are they getting their, um, their counsel of sorts? Because I've been very openly critiquing like they need a little bit of help with this. And on Roland Martin's show, I actually watched it, and he made the comment that, um, I'm sorry, Ice Cube made the comment that the only person that he really spoke to that was kind of in this work was the people from the ADOS movement, the American Descendants of Slavery. Have any of you guys covered them at all? No. I have not. <laughs> I don't, and, and that's what I'm kind of like, when I, when I try to argue with them that y'all need a serious marketing help, I'm not volunteering for it, but I'm just saying no one knows you. Uh, they swear that they're making such inroads with media. And yeah, my hypothesis is, you know, Cube got played. Like they were saying the right stuff. He was saying the right stuff. It kind of worked together. So now you have a whole very big, low, big vehicle for your message. But even with them, like I went to follow up because I was very curious as to well, what is ADOS saying about Cube's plan contract for Black America? And even with that, they were like, well, we gave him some ideas, but he didn't have like a lot of policy. So I'm like, okay. Like there's a lot so, of people kind of flying blind in this politics game and their timing is a little suspicious. So one of the things that uh, I was talking to my friend about on the West Coast is East Coast and Midwest intellectualism versus West Coast intellectualism. They're different. Uh, some, some are moving at the same space and rate, but others are this, 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 this divergence of, you don't know what you're talking about. And I think those of us who have been around a long time, we've learned to discount people who don't know what they're talking about. But this group obviously was able to tag on to someone who was popular. And you know, politics is about trending. 
And I can tell you that all of us watch trends that are going on. And, and I think, you know, to Vance's point, we might be a little older. I can tell you we ain't dumb. That's the other part. And unfortunately, we, we kind of have to go, where are you going with this? And I think that is part of where the discount comes in. Because they hadn't thought through it. I mean, don't get me wrong. Um, if I remember correctly from that interview, I watched the Roman Martin thing with Ice Cube as well. And it was clear to me that he was getting secondary sources to kind of, kind of. It, it was embarrassing, him. yeah. Yeah, um, it, and it was pimping him. I mean, yeah. to the extent that he gave the idea to Jared Kushner and he said, well, we don't like everything, but we want this little piece. And why would you even begin to have a conversation around an idea that, you know, what was the number, 600 million? That ain't enough damn money. That's, that's, that's pittance. That's what a rapper would ask for. You know, it's that old, there was a, yeah. there was a, there was a movie, what was the movie where, uh, uh, where the spoof movie with, where Mike Myers says, ask for, Oh, um, Austin dollars. Powers. <laughs> Austin um, Powers, yeah. yeah, yeah. He asked to ask for like a million, million dollars. dollars. <laughs> yeah, that type of thing. And, and the guy goes, that ain't enough money. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. And Ernie is correct when he, when he talks about, you know, come back to me when you get serious. And, and I, I say that to Vance because I love him to death, but come back to me when you're really serious. Don't come back with me. I got this got great idea. You know, I'm sorry. Okay, I can I uh, weigh in briefly? <laughs> okay. Um, kind of, I kind of see the appeal of what Ice Cube and uh, Kanye and others are doing is kind of the on the spectrum of what Charles mentioned earlier, appealing to the other who feels he hasn't heard but instead of the other being the older person who has lived what they believe a good life and sees the world through their lens of their black patriotism, they're appealing to uh, a constituency of their fans who are younger, who also feel that they haven't heard, haven't been heard, don't feel excited about Joe Biden, don't feel the political process has serve them don't see why it matters but they'll listen to an ice cube or kanye and it doesn't take a lot of them to peel off a uh, half a percent or a percent if they're voting for the first time now we may think in the grand spectrum of the whole election it won't matter but in a place where it's 50.1, it might make a difference, a small difference, but a difference. And if this wasn't an election where we have millions of people who've already voted, it might it might have been uh, damaging and devastating. Mm. Let me, let yeah, me you know, I okay. go ahead. I was gonna say, let me be clear. I don't, I don't. I'm not speaking as a form of disrespect to previous generations. That's not what I'm trying to say. I, I, I want to, spe uh, to specify that because I thought that sounded a little offensive, but I don't mean it like that. I do mean that, like many of you have said in this panel, there is um, still a group of people that don't believe in specifically Biden or other politicians in the past that might, in some cases, buy you know, an entire generation or, or, or much more mainstream may think that this person might be the best decision for us. That's what I actually mean. But I don't mean to, you know, be offensive by any case. Continue, though. <laughs> no worries. Um, working for the Crisis Magazine, the official publication of the NAACP, our coverage is always going to be skewed a little bit more toward who are they endorsing, what, they're, what are they pushing through as initiatives go. But one of the things that we have been covering extensively is um, trying to get the Zoomers or the Gen Z, the first time voters, and what are their concerns? Are, do they feel like they're being spoken to? And it's just the same as I think every generational cycle, 
Of course, they do not feel like they're being listened to, but they're so ripe for influence. And that's the interesting story to tell is like, well, who is influencing them? And who is that amazingly influential that you got teenagers who are in Black Lives Matter protests ready to somehow like change their mind and go team Trump? Like that is a wild dynamic to cover just because they'll just scream to the top, like, you know, everything from super predators to, you know, the history of the candidates, uh, Kamala and her uh, prosecutorial history. Like it is it's showing that they're well read and they, they have all this information. And at the same token, if the candidates are speaking across them or, you know, just assuming I got your vote, they're not really marketing well, in other words. I hear you. Hey, let's do it real quick there. I saw Richard Prince in the in a Oh, oh Richard, hey. Yeah. yeah. Richard. Okay, I was just about to, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Yeah, I was just putting it in the chat. Uh, I wanted to just take this discussion in a, just a slightly different direction. Okay. And that is to back up a little bit. Uh, we had uh, Julian Castro in our journalism's uh, roundtable last week. And he said, he mentioned the um, lack of diversity among the press corps was covering him. And he said that uh, without that diversity, there were a lot of nuances that were missed in the coverage of the campaign. But he didn't go into specifics. So I just wonder whether people here had any thoughts about uh, what, uh, what we bring to the table and what nuances may have been missed in the general coverage of the presidential campaign. Romer, I, that's in your backyard. Go right ahead. Yeah, I actually covered uh... yeah. Julian Castro, uh, to some extent, and um, he has a he has a, a point to a degree. I mean, we all know that there are not a, there's not enough diversity in 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 national political coverage and local political coverage, for that matter. So that point is correct. I I won't go as far as to say that's why he he lost or did oh, he wasn't he saying that action. but but he's right he is right about that and, and nuance is important uh how many of you have seen stories that have been totally out of context and you know what the candidate or the issue is about and it's not quite captured the right way uh, when you don't have someone there that can can can, can give it justice so he's absolutely right about about that that is an issue and it's interesting, uh, after the, the social justice movement of the summer, you know, I watched CNBC a lot, and um, suddenly I start, started seeing uh, more, more Black analysts on there. And I thought that that was interesting. And if that was because of what happened over the summer, that's great. But it's another example of how our voices are needed. So he's absolutely right about it. Uh, I just don't know if that was the, the reason that he didn't get traction. No, no, I, he was not saying that that was the reason. Oh, okay. uh, I was just asking uh, uh, whether we have examples of some of these nuances that were uh, missing uh, that we could point to. Go ahead. I, I, mean, I, think so. I, I, want, I want to try, Dennis, you go first and I'll, I'll follow. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's obviously, you know, Richard and Charles, you guys know the importance of diversity. Everyone does through our work with NABJ. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, you know, we at the Atlanta Journal Constitution, we have several black reporters who are covering uh, the elections, myself included, Tia Mitchell, in, who's in Washington covering the senatorial races. Uh, so we, you know, we are, the Atlanta Journal Constitution is fortunate enough to have that. And you know, bringing that nuance in is very important. I did a big story about Kamala Harris and her, her relationship with Howard University and her relationship with her sorority. And, you know, the story that I wrote about Raphael Warnock was not a typical, you know, he's, he's a Democrat running for Senate. He's also the pastor of the, one of the most important black churches in the country. And while not mentioning the fact that, you know, he was a quote unquote black preacher, I was able in my story to kind of tell a black story because of, of that institutional knowledge that I have of him and that I have of, of, of the church. So, you know, it's always important, you know, you know, like, like Romer said, you know, the reason why minorities may lose a race is not always contingent upon if they're covered by people who look like them, but it's always good to have people who look like them. And, you know, you know, heck, my, my coverage of Kelly Loeffler and, and David Perdue, that's also important. It's also important that they see my face, you know, one, you know, David Perdue, 
it was kind of a, it was an interesting situation, but I covered him the other day and I had to go on his bus uh, with him and, and, and Paris Denard and, and Sonny Perdue. And, you know, the first thing I'm thinking about when I walk on that bus is that, please God, let them have masks on. And they did, they did, you mm -hmm. know, they had masks on on the bus, but you know, that's something that I was worried about, you know, so I don't know if that that's kind of way off the, off the, off the beaten path, but it's also good for the white politicians to see us out there as well. Yeah, it's also yeah. good to, for the white politicians. Uh, some of them are vocal about it or, or will, will, when they see a, a, a black person covering their race, they automatically, some of them automatically, oh no, what's gonna happen? <laughs> you know what I mean, Richard? I mean, it's like, will this person be fair? Especially if it's a race where they're matched up against a black candidate. Mm. And, it, and to me, it's always interesting and always fun to, <laughs> to show them that you can cover a race Barely, you know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. and, and so Let me go to Denise real quick. Denise, and, yeah, because because I have to talk about the black press, which I'm a member of. Right. And sometimes I have to explain to politicians that a black reporter at a mainstream publication and the black press are operating under two different sets of circumstances. And what I would probably say to Mr. Castro or to any politician that talks about diversity in media I would say, okay, so the next time that the Philadelphia Sunday Sun or the Philadelphia Tribune or the Washington Informer calls your, calls your person or calls you for a comment for a story, return my phone call. One of the big arguments I am having right now with both the Biden and the Trump campaign is an argument over access. And I'm like, please don't sit there and look at me and, and say, well, why isn't the black press call? you know, covering me when I can't even get five minutes with your principal. If I can't get five minutes, then no, I'm not going to be able to cover you because I'm not going to, you know, grab whatever I can from the pool because my community has different questions. My readership has different questions than necessarily the readership of the Inquirer. And if you're not willing to give me a play, to give me the chance to ask you these questions, then I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear about your, you know, issues with diversity when you got like the black press, the Latino press, the Asian press that can't even get five minutes. And, it, you know, because if you don't give my community that five minutes from news organizations that they may read more so than the mainstream news organizations that you're willing to pump up, then that's your problem. And, and, it's, it, and it's something that no one ever wants to recognize. Denise, you make a great point. Charles and Richard, you probably remember this, but when we were on the board of NABJ, I guess it was 2007 or 2008, mm -hmm. and we invited Hillary, uh, Obama, and John Edwards to the convention. And John Correct. Edwards- I remember this rejected, well. <laughs> he rejected us because, you know, he didn't want to come and talk to black reporters. And then he tried to come the day of the convention because Hillary and Obama had agreed to come. And they spoke to the convention and, you know, Two weeks later, John Edwards was out of the, was out of the race. So I mm. think you know a lot of times white white politicians take us for granted just as much as some black politicians do. Well, let, let me begin with Richard. You know, um, I hope I'm not the oldest one in this group. But, <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, no. But um, uh, look, I've been the only black person in that room for a long time, and you know, I jokingly say it was the question that was being asked was, why is Charles here? I don't get that question anymore. I, I often get the question is, why isn't Charles here? Mm. I think all of us have developed relationships with people over time that uh, lend credibility to what we do. You're not going to get a softball question from me. I will have a drink with you afterwards and we will say, do some things that probably I wouldn't do when that camera goes on. Understand this, we're all professionals. I cover white politicians, I cover black politicians, I cover Latino, Asian, who the hell else is out there? But the bottom line is, I'm gonna drill down on what you're both trying to do and how you're trying to do it. As I like, like to say, don't play me for stupid. Because, you know, you, you, 
do that at your own peril. That's just an idea. Hmm. I'm yeah. curious, um, for, especially back uh, coming off what you just said, Charles, but and this is kind of for everybody. Are, are you guys seeing in all the races that you cover, the, 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 the presidential one and, uh, and all, the, all the, the state ones and the local ones and things like that, that if you're not there, if you're not the ones asking these questions about what affects us, are those questions being asked? Are the white reporters or the other reporters going after these topics, after these issues, pushing these candidates toward that? Or are we still the only, at this point, the, even as scarce as we are, the only ones who are, who, are going, who are asking these questions and putting these candidates to the, uh, uh, put, put, putting the candidates' feet to the fire on these? Mr. David, let me answer that with a straight up no. Okay. And let me add further. I'll mention about incarcerating individuals voting. Didn't, haven't heard that in many of the debates, if at all. Didn't hear that in a lot of your Senate races either. Didn't hear that from local candidates either. One reason is seeing unseen. Can't see them. So that means I can't get their vote. Let me read a quote. I've, I've been wanting to read this quote so bad from uh, Nick, from, uh, Nick, from Nicole Porter. She's director of advocacy with the Sentencing Project. Everybody, I don't have to explain what the Sentencing Project is. She says, quote, those incarcerated remain citizens and still have to pay taxes behind the walls because they buy products from the commissary. They pay for expensive phone calls. The criminal legal system acts as this mediator between state and residents, particularly black and brown residents, in stripping people of their civil and political rights. That one story I mentioned, who I talked when I talked to a gentleman named Alonzo Turner Bay, less than two and a half hours after he was released from prison. 31 years, six months, 15 days, that man spent in state prison in Jessup, Maryland. I was able to get that contact through a lady named Monica Cooper, who was with the Maryland Justice Project. They started reading us online and saying, Brother Ford, y'all the only ones that may be trying to give a voice to those incarcerated. You understand they got to vote. Well, if you understand and look at your state laws, those who held on pretrial and then cash bail, that's another little subject you can go into about cash bail. They have voting rights still. And those in pretrial have not been charged with a crime. That particular issue, I said, you know what? I could have been my cousin, I mean, my brother. And full disclosure, my brother did serve a few years in jail. So I understood how to ask and write those particular questions for this story. And I'm following it, because no one else is. So Mr. David, that's a, um, thank you for asking that, sir. That's a big issue that no one's talking about. These individuals have voting rights, especially, as I mentioned earlier, 7,000 estimated in Maryland County jails, Baltimore City, and state prisons who possibly are eligible to vote. They don't, let's say if a local race is 6,000 to 6,008, some of those who are, who, who are going back to those jurisdictions could make up the vote for who wins and who loses. Yes, that matters. Thank you. Uh, first, just real quickly, for those of you who are unaware, there is a major lawsuit that's going on in Florida regarding um, um, uh, offenders getting a right to, to, to vote. Uh, the governor there has uh, tried to put a squash on it there in the sentencing project, is in the process of trying to uh, figure that out. Uh, that is a big deal, uh, not only in Maryland, but in all the states around the country as to whether or not uh, felons can get their rights back to vote. You know, the, the Florida thing is endemic of what Will just said, out of sight, out of mind, that whole idea that, oh, you got to pay back all your fines. I know that uh, Bloomberg has agreed to put up some money, as well as Jay-Z, for uh, my hip-hop fans out there, as well as some other um, uh, celebrities who have put up money so that they can pay those fines and fees and get their rights back to vote. Um, Nikki, where do you want to go now? <laughs> I want to still allow folks to um, chime in and um, newer voices if possible. Stacey Samuel just put something in the chat and I was hoping that maybe she could like get on the mic real quick and share that with us, huh? You don't have to do camera if you don't want. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I'm a hot mess. It's a Saturday and the hair is up and understood. I haven't colored my gray. You still look good, girl. You still look good. Okay. <laughs> but I appreciate the con this conversation and the nuances that thank you, Will, for bringing up. For those of us who are currently in the mainstream newsrooms, although thankfully at the moment I am for the last year I've been with Al Jazeera, which is different because it is a, a newsroom and a news organization that's populated by those who are mostly from the global south. But I have spent 22 years in mainstream newsrooms fighting against the language that is used to categorize us from every kind of story. And when we look particularly at those of, of us um, who have lived, whether we have people in our family or people that we know, who as a result of the 1994, um, you know, high incarceration that, you know, Joe Biden has now, you know, apologized for, but those people are still in our population. They are still in our families and restoring their right to vote. Something as basic as that is still an impediment because when you look at the language that is used in newsrooms, though I will give it to the New York Times, in the last few years, they have made a concerted effort in their newsroom to change the language to explain and express that those who serve time in prison are former felons. They are former convicts. They have served their they have uh, served their time and do you know are owed the the rights of those of the rest of us right they have done they have served their du civic duty to some extent by serving out their sentences now the biggest problem we have with representation is that when i am one editor amongst dozens who's fighting for the changing of the language i'm outvoted so we this is why we need a more robust black press they will take us much more seriously they won't do a john edwards and say, eh, whatever, but they will understand because they want our vote, right? They want the coverage, they want our support. Well, we gotta keep pushing in those mainstream newsrooms, but I don't know how long that's gonna last. I don't know what that's gonna fully take. So, I mean, unfortunately, this is where I leave us without a particular resolution other than to say, that though the best we can do then as citizens, if we can't as people, as members of the fourth estate make changes, we can certainly write in to those, to all of the newsrooms that we watch and listen to, because I will tell you that they all have audience development divisions that are reading the emails. And if enough of us are galvanizing our forces and saying, wait a minute, that, re wait a minute, listen to that report. You're still referring to us as minorities when the con when this when your particular uh, story is looking at people of color. There's a difference in how you know the language is used. Anyway, that was my little rant. I'm picking up on what Will was saying. I fully support and love what you are all doing who are in the black press. I'm looking for that opportunity to be a part of the black press because I'm quite frankly, after 23 years, getting a little tired of the mainstream newsroom saying, you know, that's not fair. You're not being objective. Well, yes, I am. Okay. Come Love on you. over, Stacey. Come on over. Come on over. Hey, uh, Come to us. <laughs> kind of like to add to that on the way language is used. I've seen uh, a lot of uh, just readers in different publications pushing back on describing uh, urban describing our white supremacist terrorists as militia since that confers a legitimacy on what they're doing when they are not they, they are they are renegades they are not affiliated with any actual authority and they are terrorizing people and i've also noticed one thing i haven't noticed is a pushback on characterizing the possibility of adding justices to the supreme court it it has accept the accepted terminology is packing, which is which which is a terminology that is presented by people who are against that or are characterizing it as wrong. And I question to the panel should 
there be better and more careful consideration of using that terminology, just like there is consideration of whether you say pro-life or pro-choice and not accepting the language of those who are advocates for one side or the other. Thank you, Kelvin, appreciate that. Um, Stacy, and thank you for your comments there. Uh, we got any more comments that we wanna get in? Yeah, I, I uh, somebody brought up uh, Kamala Harris and the sorority. I think it was uh, Ernie. Mm -hmm. And I remember years ago, I was working for the Washington Informer, covering a uh, campaign event that was held by the AKAs for um, Geraldine Ferraro. And I've ne it was at the DC Convention Center, and I've never seen that many people in one room in my entire life, which said to me that, you know, they were really working to get some things moving. Now, I'm kind of wondering if anybody's heard what the AKAs might be doing for Kamala to get her, you know, get her campaign off the ground or to help her or, you know, yeah, um, back to the whole thing. And I can put my story in the chat if you guys want, but um, the yeah. AKAs, you know, they're a nonprofit organization, so they can't endorse her formally as an organization, but right. individually the women have been doing things like, you know, there have been several fundraisers. Here. One of the, one of the problems is that her fundraising efforts when she was running for president were more, uh, were more um, active, you know, because you can meet, you can have, you can have events all over the country. Now a lot of the stuff, as you know, is virtual, but you know, she has several line sisters, several sorority sisters all over the country kind of raising money for her. She, as I said, she was in Atlanta yesterday. Uh, she met with some of her line sisters. Uh, some of the, the AKs were definitely out in, in full support. But as I said, they can't do anything as a national organization for fear of losing their 501c3 status. And, you know, that's with all organizations. But individually, they're doing a lot in terms of just promoting her, raising a ton of money for her. Um, and, you know, with her being a sorority, with her being in any sorority, her being a graduate of an HBCU, a lot of those efforts are out there by HBCUs and about the different fraternities and sororities to raise money and to raise awareness for her as this black woman who is a sorority member as well as a black college graduate who's running for president. Yeah, I, I was wondering if, uh, I mean, the Republicans, they sue everybody for everything. If they might try to target you know, these fundraising efforts, you know, saying with the, you know, 501c3 uh, designation. You know, they might say that they're violating their mandate or whatever. Uh, yeah, I think, that, I think they're being very careful. I mean, I've, I've even heard talk about not wearing an AKA shirt to the polls. You know, I'm an alpha. Charles That's is an alpha. I, when I voted, I, was, I didn't wear my alpha shirt. We have these great vote shirts, you know, with our fraternity. And I'll say, you know, I'll just wear regular clothes, you know, because I don't want to be turned back. I don't want to have to walk home, you know. So, you know, I think people are being kind of careful about what they do and how they present themselves for fear of what you're talking about. One thing yeah. we didn't mention is that there are also super PACs that are being formed by various fraternities and sororities whenever these things pop up. And those are typically done unaffiliated with the actual organization themselves in an effort to kind of keep that 501c3 protection, as well as anything else that would be a conflict of their, their mission that they turned in or the constitution they turned in when they got their, their 501c3 coverage type of thing. Right. Right. Yeah, I think it's called like the Ivy Pack or something. I apologize for not knowing the name. I'm a Delta, but I think I'm pretty sure there's an AKA pack, Super Pack out there. But, but to, to you know, to go back to you to what Perk brought up, it, it, in a way, you know, this whole discussion of sororities and fraternities and and HBCUs kind of brings up the need for better coverage or need for more diverse coverage because. Um, and I read this story a while ago um, in the Washington Post. There was a woman who was covering an, uh, a rally that Kamala Harris was participating in, and the AKAs were doing their call. And she <laughs> described it as a screech. Now, my mom was an AKA, and, mm -hmm. and you know, for me oh, to have even thought about calling it a screech, I could hear her from above saying, what does she mean, screech? But that's the kind of thing that if you don't know, you need to ask someone so you don't make those kinds of mistakes. And she's still on the beat, you know, still covering Kamala Harris as part of the Joe Biden campaign. And I'm like, 
I hope you got it straight this time because I really wouldn't want to be around if you don't. Right. I think the other part is this idea of who covers campaigns and, and how do we cover them? Um, you know, um, I always look, and Will will tell you, Charles will find the youngest person who's in the pool of reporters that cover the state house. He'll pull them aside and say, if you have a question, you can ask me. Because I know when I was much younger, that was kind of like the taboo. They would go, you don't know. But how are you going to know if you don't cover stuff? And the other thing is this idea of, I'm going to put the uh, young lady from the Washington Post who went to Connecticut Westland, who didn't know, doesn't know a thing about HBC. Hey, I went to Connecticut Westland. <laughs> I know. I'm talking about the white woman, not you, Kirk. <laughs> Hey, but, and I'm a West grad too, just like Kirk, okay? <laughs> I'm not talking about you black people. But we I'm center not. the black experience <laughs> here at the Baltimore Association of Black Journalists. Sure. So, thank you. Thank you. But I, I say that because, you know, there are nuances. I, I mean, I am reminded in 1984, Jesse Jackson came into Hamilton County in Cincinnati, and I was assigned to cover him. I heard my colleagues say, oh, he's discovered a new way of raising money. And what Jesse did is what most black churches do. Anybody who's got a, a, a hundred dollars, wave that in the air, okay? If you got a hundred dollars, I want you to stand over to the right. And if you got $10,000 can raise me $20,000, come down to the pulpit. I was like, I ain't never been to a black church before. It is, it is the way we raise money. Well, this is new. This is different. It's not different than that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, at least you didn't have to explain a fish fry. Colored people, colored people. And I'm like, okay, yes, this is among the ways that Black politicians raise money for their campaigns. And yes, there is fried fish involved, but, you know, it's the principle. You know, you're, you're giving, I mean, you're having people, not everybody eats the fish. In fact, a lot of the fish fries I've been to, the fish has been pretty bad. But <laughs> that's, that's not the point. And hey, you can go to the fish fry for the food. <laughs> Uh, Dave uh, Steele brought up a good point, by the way, about the reporter in question and the fact that she had covered baseball before this, like that was her beat. So it's not like she had not been exposed to black people enough. Yeah, but baseball ain't politics. I'm sorry. Not even no, close. No slight to Dave Steele. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you ain't covered baseball in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Look at she good. was given the opportunity to cover politics where we would have, in order for us, we stand in line, we do the work, we do extra work to cover these beats, but they're not given to us. Yeah. They're typically yeah. given to white males. And since they're looking at diversity, they say, okay, we'll give it to a white female. Doesn't matter that she has no background, that she has not done the work. They don't give it to us. And why did she have, why was she even given that opportunity to fail up? It's an excellent question. Yeah. Uh, okay. A few let's, years let's, ago, let me, let me just, I'm sorry. Let me just end on this because we can go on infinitum about okay. it. Okay. It is the reason why we need all of you to support all of us. And yes, if, if to give an example, on election night, I give up the opportunity to make money, and I work with students at Morgan State University. I, I put them through the rigors. They, some of them curse at me. Some of them get, don't like me at the end of the night, but I said, but you learned. And they go, you're right. And some of them have gone on. One of them actually won an Emmy, if you can believe that. And I urge all of us, look around. Don't just look in our little box. See who is struggling. See who has that empathy and that desire to want to learn and allow us to be that conduit. 
And that's for everybody on this call. Because at the end of the day, I know that Charles Robinson's career will end at some point. I don't know when it will. It's not ready to at this point. But I know that if I don't put people in that pipeline, because all of us have heard from recruiters and others said, well, we can't find people. You know, that's BS. It just didn't look. So let us do the looking. Let us find people who maybe is the copy editor who ha has a, hasn't had that opportunity. Uh, the Stacey Samuels of the world, who we know is, isn't, is not just smart, but smart enough to do this work. Because I know at the end of the day, we are going to change the world. And I believe that. And all we have to do is to make sure if we're not there, that someone else is there. I want to thank you for listening. And Nikki, I think we're almost at the end here, right? Um, I think so. I wanted to make sure I made time to talk about the upcoming series on MPT, Maryland Public Television. I'm sorry, Maryland Public Television. I'm tired. Uh, do you have a little bit of a preview to tell us about? Just real quickly, um, for the last four weeks, I have been asked to be the senior producer, the writer, and talent on a, a three-hour program that we're airing on Maryland Public Television. It's called The Conversation with MLK. We were able to acquire a 1963 interview with David Tuskegee that has not been aired on television in over 40 years. There is uh, no doubt about the fact that uh, the Negro is more determined now than ever before to be free. Let's stop thinking that our black don't matter. That's right. And vote. Our investigation found that Mattingly and Cosgrove were justified in their use of force. The Negro has not yet turned to the point of giving up altogether and giving up with a sense of hopelessness. I think there is still uh, a great sense of hope uh, and, and a basic faith in America on the part of the American Negro. On um, Monday, I will be on with uh, Dr. Kasonia Whitehead, known as Dr. K, talking about uh, our process for putting this together. As you can see, uh, it was a Herculean effort. And um, it was the first time that, it was not the first time that we've had a black producer. It was the first time I was ever named as a senior producer on a project like this. Well deserved, congratulations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we got more things for you to produce in the future, so we need your help. So thank you very much, Charles. Uh, to the panel, to giving up uh, two hours out of your Saturday to share your expertise, to do deep dives, and to laugh and kiki with us all the same. We do appreciate you so much, and thank you for giving us a national outlook on uh, not just a national campaign, but also all politics is uh, local. So letting us know how a lot of things you described in Georgia and Philadelphia um, and in Texas really do resonate here in our Maryland market. So we do appreciate your time, and I know that you're a lot of things you can do on Saturday. Thank you for spending your Saturday with us. To our guests that uh, came to see, you know, what BABJ is like on a Saturday, on a fourth Saturday, we appreciate y'all. Um, know that we are very open. We just want to make sure this is a Black safe space. So you're welcome to come through. Just, you know, understand that we are centering the Black experience and Black journalists and media-related professionals every time we meet. So you're always welcome to come back. And if you want to join us, you can always join us on our website, babjmd.com.